Welcome into Other People's Shoes. I'm your host, Neil, and today I'm so excited because in today's episode, we sit down with my brother-in-law, Kennedy. I got to be honest with you. When I first started recording this episode, I thought, oh my goodness, where is this going to go? He's very emotional about this idea of church and why he left. You're probably going to hear some of that emotion come out in this episode. It's been emotional on both sides, I would say. But really, the whole premise, right? We're in his shoes. You may hear some things that you just don't jive with. But I want to remind you, especially on this episode, we're in Kennedy's shoes. I hope you're ready, because you know I am. Here we go! Hey, come take a walk with me, not like you used to do. Do something different and put yourself in other people's shoes. Open up your mind and open up your eyes and change your direction, change your perspective. Welcome into Other People's Shoes. I'm your host, Neil. And uh, today we sit down with really uh, my first family member. Um, I tried to do an episode a while back with my mother-in-law, more to that in uh, later episodes, perhaps foreshadowing that. But today I sit down with, I can say it with confidence, author (laughs) Kennedy. Can I say your last name? Am I allowed to? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, author, Kennedy Stearns. He is an author. Uh, not which a good one. Not a good one, apparently. We talked that pre-show. But uh, he is an author. He is also my brother-in-law. And he is also in a unique situation in my mind. And that's this. He was a church kid. And now he's no longer a church kid. So we're diving right back into that uh, uh, series that we're in, this season that we're in of why people leave the church. And Kennedy, you are one of these people that popped into my head immediately when I started thinking about the issue of church kids and mm-hmm. why they have left. And, you know, you even talked a little pre-show, like this is a hot button for you. This is, this, this is a, this is a challenging episode. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So before we get into that, we're going to get into some just fun stuff. Uh, cause I was, I always like to lead with some fun stuff. So Kennedy, what size shoe do you wear? Uh, 13. Are you kidding me? Nope. It is awful shopping for shoes. Wow. Yep. 13. Mm-hmm. All right. I'm coming to grips with that. Well, at least we'll be able to fit in your shoes today. Yeah. Because oh. I wear an 11. Yeah. And 10 and a half, 11. So. There's very few people who won't fit in my shoes. Wow. I mean, does Nike make clown shoes? Sorry, I'm being mean. I'm Maybe. being mean. But you're my brother-in-law. I can be a little yeah. mean, right? Oh, absolutely. Okay. So uh, do you have a brand that you like to wear? A, a style? A, a, um... Usually hiking boots. Um, I find that they're more comfortable. Uh, because for me personally, uh, boots seem to actually support my ankles in a way that most other shoes don't. Uh, like my wife, she wears Converse, which are real short. And yeah, I absolutely wear my Vans could today. not do that. Yeah. yeah, I could not do that. That yeah. would kill me. Yeah. But us- usually boots. Okay. Do you have a style like Timberland or I think those are kind of high end high tech. Do they still make boots? High tech boots? High tech hikers? I don't know. Maybe. Didn't do a lot of research on boots today. So. I don't know. Just uh, whatever hiking boots I find that are decent price range. They got to be 13s and they yeah. got to be decent. Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, wow. I go through shoes real fast. So we're on a journey. I like it. We're on a hiking journey today yeah. through this episode. Wow. Nice segue there, Kennedy. You didn't even know you segued, but you did it. Nice job. High five. I welcome to the <laughs> Welcome to the world of podcasting. So, uh, well, let's dive in. Um, you know, I'm not one to wade in the water. I like to just kind of cannibal into stuff. So um, tell me in your own words, like your church experience. Like from the time you remember till the time that you said, hey, I'm out of here, I'm, I'm, I'm gone. So it, whatever that looks like, I'm going to let you take over. So that's a bit of a long trip. OK. Um, Is there a shortened kind of Reader's Digest without? Yeah, I'll, I'll do my best to condense it. OK. Uh, when I was a kid, I went to church because that's what my family did. You right. know, they, they that's just how it was. Um And then probably around 12, 13, I started realizing I don't believe this. My family believes this, but I don't. Um, And around that time was when I kind of started not wanting to go to church. Um, I really I really didn't appreciate the fact that I had to go whether I wanted to or not. Um, 
And then probably around 16, 17 or so, I started getting involved with youth groups and things like that. Um, And it was really hard for me to be the one person there who didn't want to be there. Uh, So I just kind of faked it until I made it. You know, I pretended and I even kind of convinced myself for a while that, yeah, this is this is me. I'm I'm in, you know, Uh, and then. You know, I turned 18, kind of moved out to another city and uh, realized that that's that's really not me. That's not who I am and that's not what I believe. I didn't and still am not sure entirely what I do believe, but I know it's not that. Um, And the fact that I was kind of pushed into it for so long definitely had an effect on my interest level in the future, you know, Um I've tried to go back a few times. I've tried to kind of because, I mean, honestly, from from my point of view, it's it would be nice. I would love that if I could believe that there was a God up there who cared personally about me. That sounds phenomenal. Like that would make life so much easier. But I don't. And so that makes it, you know, kind of I I see what you guys have. I see what Christians have. And. For the for the true Christians, that's great. I more power to you, but I just I I don't, you know. So let's go back to thirteen. Mm-hmm. Do you remember what year that was, by the way? Oh gosh, that would be <laughs> uh, like two thousand six, two thousand seven. You're a math maybe? guy. Come on, no, really? Okay, no. all right. We're gonna say roughly two thousand six. Mm-hmm. Fair. Yeah. Okay, so two thousand six. Um, you have this awakening. I mean, it, you woke up one morning. Talk to me about what that looked like in that moment. Was it a moment? Was it a series of events? I mean, what what is, what's the what's the chain of events that leads to that? I wouldn't I wouldn't say it's really a moment. Um, you know, at about that age, you're kind of starting to develop an identity. You know, you're you're making friends. You're uh, deciding what kind of hobbies you like. You know, whether that's books, games, hiking, jogging, whatever. Um, and as I was kind of sort of coming to grips with who I was and learning about myself, I realized that I had heard other people talk about what it was like to go to church and what it was like to pray. Um, and you know, they would, they would talk about these experiences they had and how they, they felt God. Um, and I realized that I, I never did that. You know, that, that wasn't me. I just went because that's what you did, you know? Um, and that was kind of a, kind of a hard thing for me to realize at the time because when you do something your entire life and then you realize it's not there you know that's a very strange uh strange thing especially for a young kid who is afraid to talk to his parents about it to go through you know um because it's it's just almost earth shattering because you know that was my entire life like Ever since I can remember, I went to church every Sunday, probably every Sunday night, every Monday, every Wednesday. And that was constant, you know, and then I kind of realized I don't I don't want to do this. I don't like this. I don't get this. Um, So that was definitely a uh, kind of a game changer. So in that you're like you said, you're being forced to go. Mm -hmm. what would it have looked like if you had dug your heels in, you know, said, no, I'm, I'm taking a stand, you know, especially at 13, uh, talk to me about that. What, what would that have looked like? I, I tried a couple times and it was, it was not an option. Uh, if I didn't go to church, I would have been punished. Um, and that was, well, that what, was the what would the punishment have been like? When I was younger, probably, you know, like spanking, sit in the corner, uh, as I got older, it would have been. I get to sit in my room with no computer, no books, no anything, and that's my life now, which is not great for a teenager. Sure. Wouldn't be great for most people, yeah. Yeah, true. Um, Did you ever, at one point in time, try to have a conversation with your parents or or with maybe another leader in the church to say, hey, I I don't know if I'm really, you know, subscribing to this. I don't know if I'm really believing in this. I'm really having some major doubts here on this. Did did that ever occur? I 
I attempted to a couple of times with my parents, um, but it, it's very hard for me because I I am very strongly an emotional person. You know, I feel things very strongly. And so when I talk about something that's important to me, uh, it's often hard for me to keep my cool. And, you know, it's it's one of those things where I I really had things that I wanted to say, but I couldn't say them because what I felt got in the way. If that makes sense. Okay. So even now, you're how old now? Uh, 24. You ever had that conversation with them? I've... I, I don't really think I have, no. Okay. Um, yeah, no. I don't I don't think I've or at least not in a way that's gotten through to both parties. All right. So let's take that moment. Mm-hmm. They're in the room right now. They're not. It's yeah. just you and I and your wife and by the way it's you know, it's um just for clarification's sake, it's five forty seven in the morning when we're taping this. I, I work nights. So I know. So I, I, I appreciate, really appreciate no, I appreciate you, no. you know, taking some moments. I always appreciate people that give up time. But Well, to but, be honest, you're the first person who's done something to my schedule and that really means a lot to me. Oh, like thanks, most buddy. of my friends or family no. members, they don't Care. No, I, I care because to me, to me, what you're having to say is valuable. Mm-hmm. I might not love what you have to say. Let's be clear on that. I, yeah. I, I'm going to be honest there. I might not love what you have to say, but it's not about me right now. It's about you. So let's pretend it's just you, me, Lacey, and, and your cat. You'll probably hear the cat in the background yeah. every now and then, but, but it's me, you, and your wife, and that's it. Mm-hmm. We're here. But if your mom and dad were here right now, what would you tell them about church? That going to church when I didn't want to did far more damage to my faith or lack thereof than any video game or book or TV show or anything like that ever did. Um, I, I, I didn't watch the first Star Wars movie until I was like, what, 14, 15? You were there for that. Yep. Uh, because Star Wars, the force is basically magic and magic is Satan. Um, so that, that was the level of, uh, I guess you could say attempted uncorruptedness that I was given, you know? Um, and that royally backfired as things like that tend to do, you know? I mean, now I play Dungeons and Dragons constantly. Like, weekly I have Dungeons and Dragons sessions. It's not evil. It's literally a game where you roll dice, you know? You pretend to be a wizard because that's fun. But I I really don't think I would have some of the interests I do nearly as much if things like that hadn't been taboo when I was younger. So what would you say to him? I mean, you, you kind of, if I, you don't, I, I mean, if you don't want to answer that, that's fine. But I just thought this would be a great opportunity. They're not here. I, I, I think I would really say that I, I wish I could believe what you believe, but I don't. And you, you've told me before, I, I, by my own parents, I was told that I'm too intelligent for my own good or too intelligent for my own good, which is just a really dumb statement in my opinion. Um, and that, that kind of hurt. Um, but I, I feel like because I don't believe what they believe In a way, I'm a disappointment. Um, and that's not fair, is what I would tell them. It's not... Sorry. Um, that's okay. We we didn't rehearse this. Fair. We didn't rehearse this. It's okay. You're being real, Kennedy. Yeah. It's okay. I, I think that's a big part of what I would tell them. That's that's not fair. So if, so if I'm hearing you correctly, that's what you're saying, is is that by by not believing, by not going to church, by not... Because it's one thing to say, hey, I don't believe, but, you know, or say I don't go to church, but I still believe. I've had people that have said that. But you're saying, not only do I not be, not not only do I not go to church, but I also don't believe. And by doing so, um, by doing so, you feel like you've been a disappointment to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. 
So got a couple of questions that jump into my head. Uh, mm-hmm. First off, do you ever remember in that moment in those years ever saying to yourself, hey, I, I've accepted Jesus in my heart? Did you ever feel like there was that moment? Time you? and time again. I tried. Yeah. I tried so many times. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, you say there's so many times. Was there like a specific moment ever where you, you, they call it the sinner's prayer or something of that nature? You know, do you ever really feel like you accepted him as your savior? I I feel like I told myself I did. Okay. I wanted to. Okay. Um, but that that never happened in a way that I could genuinely say yes. That that just happened. You know. Okay. Um, I've, I've told people many times that I've had that experience, that, you know, kind of moment of some people describe it as relief of, you know, you know that you are taken care of now. Um, and I've, I've time and time again told people that, yes, I've had that experience. I have, you know, this, this is it. This is finally the time that it's real. But none of them have been real. None of them have really meant anything to me in a way that I wasn't lying to myself. Okay. So in that feeling like your disappointment, feeling like you've let them down, do you, do you feel in any way that, that you feel like you've let God down in any way by not believing? Not particularly. No. Okay. If, if there is a God, if he is out there, uh, I think I would have far more problems with him than for him to be interested in having me, you know, in heaven. So I, I think that would be, I, I, if I'm a disappointment, I already am, you know, my belief or lack thereof has no effect on that. I would say. So going back to when you're, you know, 16 and even when you get out of the house and, and you started, as you said, you know, you really started to think for yourself and mm-hmm. really think about, you know, is this a path? Is this a journey? Is this a hike? Whatever I could go down. Uh, what kind of thoughts are going through your mind when during that process? Is it a constant thing or is it? I mean, t- t- tell me about that. I'd say it was more of a, a time to time thing. Um, I was I was really in a way envious of people who did have that who who really really felt that because it life must be so much easier when you you know where you're going you know um and so that's that's part of why I kept trying over and over and over again to convince myself that that was real you what, know what are the things you tried i uh, would uh, sit and uh, pray and i'm using air quotes here for hour two hours just desperately trying to feel something you know i would read through the bible over and over and over again and it it was just words you know and i i tried going to churches i tried having people pray for me I tried, you know, reading books that are like, here's how you get a better walk with God, things like that. And I mean, I tried everything I could think of to get myself in a place where I was on board with it. Did you ever meet with like a pastor or any kind of spiritual mentor? What did that look like? Uh, When I was living in Idaho in Boise, um, there was a... A time I was walking down the road and I was hitchhiking, trying to get back to where I was staying at the time. Um, and a guy picked me up and drove me drove me to where I was staying. And we were chatting in the car. Uh, and the subject of church came up, and he said, "Hey, you should you should come to my church sometime." And I ended up going with him. And uh, uh, him and his group kind of took me in. You know, they were all about six to ten years older than me, but they they kind of took me in. Um, and I, I shared with them, you know, what I've told you, I shared with them how I felt and what I really wanted. Um, and we would meet on Thursday nights at his house and it wasn't a, it wasn't like a men's meeting or a Bible study or anything. We would just meet and just talk, you know, like a group of men just talking to each other and being real. Um, and you know, I mean, 
from time to time, one of them would be talking about a, a crisis of faith they had had. And I really felt like I learned a lot from them, just not what I had initially hoped to learn. What did you hope to learn? I, I hoped to learn the secret, you know, the, mm. the magic ingredient to get to a point where I felt right about it, you know, to, to the point where I felt God, so to speak. Um, and you know, they, they all had it, that, that little X factor. Cause you know, I mean, regardless of what their belief system is, when someone really truly believes in what they're talking about, you can tell, you know, people, they have a shine about them when they, when they have faith in something and it can be different things for different people, but you know when someone really believes what they're saying and these guys had it you know like they were they were in and i was hoping that by being around them and you know trying to watch them and mimic them and learn from them that i could get in you know um but it it didn't work So I heard this quote this last two weeks or so, and uh, in the quote, it's more of a statement than a quote, but uh, in in this statement, uh, this speaker is talking about our view of God in a fatherly sense. You know, the the Christian Bible teaches that God is our father. A lot of other religions do as well, but but the Christian Bible teaches that. And maybe you know that. I'm Mm -hmm. sure you do. Yep. 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 So in that, he makes this statement. He says, the first thing you think about your earthly father is the first thing you think about God. So with that, what would be the first thing you think about when you think about your earthly father? First statement that comes to mind. The complicated. Um, Yeah. I would echo that. (laughs) Shout out to Tim. Um, I would echo that. Um, So in that, if we were going to take that phrase, that that word complicated, that's your word. You Mm -hmm. said it. I didn't. I just agreed with it. Um, Would you apply that also to to God on an earthly or from a heavenly father standpoint? Yeah, Yeah, I think I would. Okay. And and why would that? Why, Why would you make that correlation? between the two because if if there is a god if he is a you know the the christian god of the bible there are a lot of things going on that do not make any sense um and you would have to be a pretty complicated person to come up with some of the things that are here on earth and out in the universe you know um some some things are beautiful beyond description um you know the night sky when you're away from the city and you just look up and it's just a field of stars and then some things are horrible beyond description um and in order to make both of those extremes you really would have to be a layered complicated person you know um you couldn't do that if you were all good or all evil. So, so with this, uh, I'm going to go a little deeper. Mm-hmm. So you you said we can go deep, yeah. and then you'll stop if we're going too deep into the water, right? All right, mm-hmm. fair enough. So you and Lacey, you got married in a church. Mm-hmm. Isn't Lacey's family a little? Uh, aren't they involved in a church? Yeah. So where's the disconnect there? Um, as far as uh, what I mean by that is, um, how does one get married in a church, stand before God in a church, but then want also nothing to do with God? Do you see the paradox there? Not particularly. Um, Lacey is the one who wanted the marriage to take place in a church, you know, um, that she grew up in that church. She went there her whole life, still does. Um, for me, that's it's tradition it's a you know it's a i i I like it i'm i'm a hopeless romantic at heart and i like that you know kind of image um and you know it was 
it, it really is the bride state, you know? And so regardless of what I do or don't believe, there was no way I was going to take that away, especially when it's something that I like the idea of in the first place, you know? Um, it's, to me, it's not a religious thing, you know? It's a commitment you're making. Um, it, it has nothing to do with religion. Okay. I just was curious because... Yeah. You know, I, I kind of had that feeling going into your wedding. I was fortunate enough, blessed mm-hmm. enough to attend your wedding, which thank you for that. Um, but then at the same time, I'm like, wait a second. If he doesn't really believe in this, if he doesn't really, you know, I always say subscribe to, which mm-hmm. probably is not the right wording, but it's good for a podcast. It, it's good for a podcast. <laughs> subscribe now. But, I, you know, watching, tuning in, whatever you want to say, believing in, you know, all those things, uh, actively supporting, you know, you could insert any adjective you want in there. Mm-hmm. But you still made that choice to do that. Yeah. You know, so I, I think that's noble of you to kind of set your own personal stuff aside to say, hey, this is the better for for my bride. This is what she wants. This is this is for her. You know, this is her day. I, I like all those things. And I like what you said, too. You know, that helpless romantic thing. It's, it's right up my alley, too. Mm-hmm. So getting back into this, Kennedy, um, was there anybody in church that you felt outside of your parents that you could have gone to and shared this? I, I know we kind of talked about it a little bit, but. But was there anybody? Was there like a youth leader? Was there, you know, another mentor? Because it's, you know, I've met a lot of church kids Mm -hmm. and and they did have that youth leader. I mean, for a lot of years, maybe I was that person for for some of those, not tooting my own horn, but I I know for some kids I was that outlet for, Um, you know, I, we have great friends, you know, they, that their, their dad was, was my outlet because my dad wasn't there a lot of times. So Mm -hmm. was there somebody in your life that you felt like you could have had that outlet with? Not, not really. Um, the problem wasn't them. The problem was me. Um, because when, let, let's say you're a teenager, right? And you're, you're in high school, um, and you are, for whatever reason, put in band class, right? right. You don't play an instrument, but you're put in a band class anyway. You just want to fit in. You know, you don't want to admit to anyone that you don't play an instrument. So you will try and find ways to, oh, well, I'll clean the instruments or I'll do this or I'll do that so that you can fit in and not stand out, you know. Um, And that was the problem. I I didn't trust anyone enough to be willing to open myself up like that because that's scary. You know, I, I still have trust issues. That's that's on me. Um, there were a few people who I really wanted to open up to. Um, one of my one of my friends in high school, uh, his, his name was Terrence, and he was he was very, very devoutly Christian. You know, he believed in a very strong way, and I always admired that about him. But I couldn't open up to him because how can you tell someone who believes so strongly that you don't, you know? And that was, that was something that I I wanted to open up to him, but I just, I just couldn't. Wow. I can't imagine walking through life where I couldn't go to my parents and I couldn't find a close friend that I'm struggling with this idea of not, not God. I mean, but not, not even church, but just God or just anything. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, what was that like? It, it wasn't great. Um, it really wasn't great. It took me 22 years and four suicide attempts before I got to the point where I realized, Hey, you have to open up to someone doesn't matter if you get hurt, doesn't matter what happens, you have to do it. Um, and I mean, life has been significantly better since I have started opening up to, you know, certain people in my life. Um, but it, it was not easy. It was miserable. It was extremely miserable. (laughs) How valuable are you? I would say that depends on your point of reference. Um, 
my wife would hopefully say I'm extremely valuable. Um, <laughs> she bank, is. I can hear her in the background. She is. She's saying that. <laughs> my bank would say I'm not valuable at all. <laughs> Fair um, enough. Yeah. Most banks wouldn't. Yeah. But I think I would not place much value on myself. Um, uh, yeah. I Not much. Okay. Not very. Okay. Because I'm I'm hearing kind of a, a little bit of a theme. Mm-hmm. If I'm, uh, you know, obviously stop me if I'm putting words in your mouth, but it, it seems like there's almost this value issue, deep rooted, mm-hmm. deep rooted issue of value, right? And I'm not a psychologist, you know that. I'm not a don't have any degrees in doctorates or anything like that. But but this deep rooted issue of of um, you know, a value, and then of course belonging. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, on top of that, disappointment. Yeah. Those three really core yeah. issues, those right? Are, those are three. Good so if you're words. if you're not finding value, right, in the church, mm-hmm. why be a part of it, right? If you're feeling disappointment that you're feeling like you're not only letting your earthly parents down, but you're letting you know potentially, you know, your heavenly Father down, mm-hmm. right? And then, of course, this <clears throat> this idea of of just belonging and just you know who you are. Yeah. Wow. And trust, you know, that comes into a part of it too. Mm-hmm. So this Barna group, uh, they're, they're a Christian research group. I invite you cause I know you are a reader. You love to read. I mean, ever since I've known you, this kid read encyclopedias and memorized <laughs> them. That's right. If you don't know what an encyclopedia is, go home and Google it. But, uh, back in the day, Kennedy would sit in the back seat and recite things that he had learned from the encyclopedia and memorized them uh, from a young age. I think yeah, I knew you at probably like three or four. I, yeah. I might have to have somebody fact check me on that, but we have a video of me yeah. at like maybe four. Yeah. You were asking me like, who's the president? Right. And yada, yada, yada. Yeah. I think it was Bill Clinton at the time. Yeah, it was probably Bill Clinton. Yeah. So that would probably been 98. Um, yeah. So there we are. But these are, these are six reasons the Barner group discovered, um, Coming coming out of this book called "You Lost Me," I read it number of year or number of years, number of months back, mm-hmm. and that's what kind of led to this series of podcasts that we're on now. So uh, these are in no particular order, but these are the six reasons people leave. I'm just curious what you think. So agree, disagree, and then if you want to obviously add some some you know, of your opinion into that, I would I would love to hear that too. So here we okay. go. Reason number one: uh, churches seem overprotective. Agree or disagree? I would say bad churches seem overprotective. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that's a reason I wouldn't go to a church, though. Um, or rather, that's not a reason I wouldn't go to church. That is a reason I wouldn't go to a specific church, though. I, I have experienced a few churches that were like that. Yeah, they were way overprotective. Yeah, how so? They they were a clique. You mm-hmm. know, um, they. They would let new people into the church, obviously, but they didn't really let them in. You know, you were there, but you weren't a part of it. Um, and that's that's definitely a problem in smaller churches, it seems to me. Um, whereas bigger churches, you have enough people to where even if there is a click, there's probably one for you too, you know? Um, but yeah, I, I would say only smaller churches have that problem. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, reason number two, teens and 20 somethings experience of, of Christianity is shallow. Um, I would say that that kind of, that's kind of a case by case basis thing. Um, I, I definitely know some people who have little to no experience with church, Um, and they probably wouldn't go to church because they have little to no experience. But then I also know some people who have a lot of experience with church and they wouldn't go to church because they have a lot of experience. So, I mean, it uh, could go either way. Could go either way. Okay. All right. Uh, reason number three, you'll love this one. I feel like this is, this is a Kennedy question. Uh, reason number three, churches come across as antagonistic to science. Yes. Oh God. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd like that one. Yes. In fact, when I first read that one, I was like, this yeah. is a, this is a Kennedy question. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Prior to even, you know, me thinking about you doing this, I thought, well, this is, this is a total Kennedy question. So, mm-hmm. uh, what are your thoughts on that? I, I very much agree. Um, 
And I, I understand that not all Christians and not all churches, however, a significant majority of churches and Christians are behind the times. Um, and it's it's been that way since the Christian church existed, you know? I mean, uh, gosh, uh, uh, what was his name? Uh, Talking Bill Nye? No, oh. the guy, um, I want to say Galileo, but I okay. could be wrong. The one who was like, hey, by the way, guys, uh, the Earth orbits around the sun and not mm. the other way around. Okay. And they were like, no, we're Nos- locking you up. Nostradamus, because, maybe even? Uh, yeah, I mean, okay. I, w- I wouldn't. We'll, we'll fact check you on that one. Yeah. How about that? We'll um, fact check you on that one. But but some famous scientist that, yeah, that they, is and, very prominent says this statement. Yeah. And they said, no, 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 no. That's patently untrue. You're going to be put under house arrest for years and years and years. And that has kind of been the attitude of the church as a you know majority for a very long time. Okay. Uh, reason number four, young Christians, church experience related to sexuality are often simplistic and judgmental. Yeah, I would agree. Um, yeah, I would, I would definitely agree. That's, that's something that, uh, and, and again, this, this honestly comes back to the previous question. Um, studies have shown that rates of teen birth decrease if you give good sexual education. And the problem is parents don't want their kids getting a sexual education at a school, mostly fundamentalist parents, you know, mostly conservative parents, because they feel that that's not the school's place or they don't want their kids learning about it or anything like that. Um, The thing is, you the more you make something like that taboo, the more they're going to lean into it. You know, that's, that's just how it is. Um, so I, I definitely think that that is a problem, you know? Okay. Reason number five, uh, they wrestle with the exclusive nature of Christianity. So Jesus, you might remember in your Bible reading, or maybe even your time in the church, uh, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Mm -hmm. That, to me, says a very exclusive statement. How would you respond to that? I would agree that 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 is a problem that a lot of people have with the church. Um, uh, Because, I mean, the thing is, some belief systems, they don't mind if you are double dipping, so to speak. Um, What do you mean by that? Help me out with that. So, for instance, if you're, say, a, you know, a Buddhist, they don't mind if you're also a... Uh, Muslim or Christian or anything like that. However, if you are a Christian, you cannot be anything else. So uh, I definitely agree that, you know, some people have a problem with thinking, okay, this is the one true possible thing. Right. Sorry about my cat going nuts. You're, you're fine. What's the cat's name? Uh, Dirk, Dirk gently. Dirk gently. Uh, reason number six, this, uh, again, feel like this is right up your alley. So, here we are. Reason number six. The church feels unfriendly to those who doubt. Yes. That, Why? Yeah. Why? Um, because you're you're supposed to toe the party line, you know, and that is in a lot of cases, that's how it is. And obviously there I I know looking back, I know there are plenty of people who would have been fine if I had come to them and said, hey, this is where I am, this is what I'm thinking and feeling and I don't believe, you know? But that's not what it felt like. That's not, and and I mean, regardless of if they're correct or not, feelings are valid. Feelings have, you know, you can't, you can't feel something wrong, you know? Um, and regardless of whether the thing that causes that feeling it even exists that that doesn't matter if you feel like that it's th- that's how it is for you you know so regardless of the fact that i i think a lot more churches are actually sympathetic to that than most people feel but it doesn't feel like they're sympathetic to it and that's the problem if that makes sense it does 
You and Lacey don't have kids. Mm-mm. I'm putting you on the spot here. So this is, again, another little extra liberty as far as brother-in-law, show host, whatever you want to category you want to put me in. Do you want to have kids? Eventually, yeah. Okay. Once, once not not stable. putting any pressure. No, no, like, hey, six months from now, we expect I, you to you're not have mom, kids. So I, yeah, I, I'm not I'm your not mom. Married. I'm not. I'm just yeah. the brother-in-law uh, and the show host right now. But um, what would you... Five stars. You, yeah, thank you. Uh, rate it up on iTunes right now. Um, what would... What will you tell your kid and maybe kids, kid and kids about God, church? What, what will be the, the message that is communicated to them? I will tell them that they need to find their own way, um, that I am there if they have questions, but that's their path. You know, I can't walk it for them and I can't make them walk the path um, because at that point you're just dragging them. That's it. Uh, so... You know, I will be if they decide, hey, I want to I want to go to church. You know, I want to quote DC talk, be a Jesus freak. Great. I will 100 percent support them. I will drive them to and from church. And I, I think that's that'll be awesome if that's what they decide to do. They found something that I couldn't. And that's good. You know, uh, as a I, I feel like as a father, I would be proud of them for that. Um but if they don't, I'm proud of them for making their own way, you know. Um, I, I really think that they, you know, a child needs that ability to choose for themselves, you know, once they get to that age. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's what I'll tell them. I'll tell them that you got to find your own way, but I'm, I'm here if you want to, you know throw something at a wall and see what sticks. So let's fast forward. I know we're, we're talking hypotheticals here and I, I don't necessarily like to talk hypotheticals, but you know, sometimes it's fun, right? Mm -hmm. So hypothetically speaking, your we'll call him your son comes to you. He's 18. He says, dad, mom, I'm sitting you down. I have felt called to go to the Congo to share Jesus with people. What's your reaction to that? I would be proud beyond words. Um, if if I if my son or daughter decided to go into the world and actively make it a better place, regardless of if I agree with their reasons, regardless of even if I agree with what they're doing, if they are trying their best to make the world a better place. I think that is unequivocally a good thing. Um, and, you know, I would I would be scared as any parent would be, I imagine. But I think that would be fantastic. I would be I would be so proud. That it, it doesn't matter what they're doing as long as they're making the world a better place in your mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. OK. All right, last question, then we're going to play a game. By the way, it's a dice game. Oh, I, well, we've got like 60 sets of a dice. Actually, it's so. a die. I always say dice. Oh, okay. And well. I got corrected in my like third show. Somebody's like, it's a die, Neil. And every time I say dice, it's really just a die. But anyway. Well, we've got plenty of those. So. Thank you. All right. <laughs> so last question. So uh, going back to your parents again, yeah. if you were to get them one-on-one, -on -one, one-on-one -on -one, or maybe even both of them together in the room, sitting them down. What would you say? Right now. I think... Uh, hmm. Because you've know. you've given us a lot, and and yeah. your mom listens when your sister shows her how to listen. <laughs> so, and she knows that you're going to be on, so maybe she'll make it more of a you know proactive like figure out how to how to listen. Mm -hmm. um, but Kennedy, my concern uh, is is I think what you're saying is valuable, mm -hmm. super valuable. I too grew up in the church. I don't think my parents ever made us go until. You know, as kids, we did. We had to. That was what we did. You know, I fell asleep probably more often than not in church. You know, if I didn't fall asleep in church, then then I got a prize at the end of the day. So, you know, there was motivation to stay awake. 
But I did make the choice at 16 to stay. Mm-hmm. I did make the choice, you know, even now as an adult to, to continue to go. So it's, it's, it's fascinating to me from that respect that you the grew up, the environment you grew up in. And I watched it, right? Yeah. I mean, I was around. Yes. You know, so I got to see it. I didn't get to see the 16 year Kennedy and the 18 year Kennedy, you know, that you were, you were kind of not as involved, but, Mm -hmm. but I say all that because going back would, like we were talking about the other night, you know, after Avengers is, is there any moment in your life that you would say, I'm spoiling Avengers. Hopefully everyone's seen it by the time (laughs) this show ends, but in Avengers, they go back in time and they change some things. Oops. Spoiler. Spoiler. But would you go back in time and change something from your past involving this this church and this God belief? I think if you had asked me that question five years ago, I would have said, yes, absolutely. Um, there's a laundry list of things I would have changed back then. But where I am now, no. I mean, I if you had told me four years ago that I was going to be married and you know with a steady job i've had my job for two years which almost two years which is just unbelievable to me because i am a job hopper i just go and go and go guilty yeah Yeah. um and uh, you know if you had told me that i would be where i am now i wouldn't have believed you i would have i would not have believed you um but Everything that happened, whether it was good or bad, it put me where I am now. Um, And I wouldn't want to risk that, you know? Like, again, spoiling Avengers, uh, what Tony said to Cap, you know, if we can go back and fix things, that's great. But what I have now, keeping what I have now is my priority. And so I I wouldn't change anything, Um, you know? I would I would do it all again if it put me where I am now. So, yeah, I, I don't I don't think I would. Okay. All right. You ready for the dice game? Yeah. Okay. Ready for the dice game? Here we go in this amazing cup. Uh, are you using your dice? Oh, Could, oh, you already got. This. I, okay. I'm I'm prepared, buddy. I, all right. This is a full encompassing show. We come ready. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we're sitting in Kennedy's living room amongst all of the uh, gaming <laughs> and all kinds of stuff I don't even recognize. There's probably some Harry Potter stuff in here. Uh, no Harry Potter stuff. Okay, no Harry Potter. That tells you I don't even recognize some of the stuff. So, is that Pokemon back there, by the way? No, no, no. Okay. That's uh, Studio Ghibli. Okay. Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. Very good film. You should see it. You probably wouldn't like it. Fair enough. <laughs> I have no idea what you just said to me, but all right. So roll the die that's in the magical cup. Look at what kind of cup that is. This is a nice cup, isn't it? Yeah, North Carolina blue. There we are. Number six. I love number six. So we're playing a game called Senseless. Mm-hmm. So how I always like to end the show. So you get to roll the die, and then we ask you questions based on the senses. Now you're thinking to yourself, well, wait. There's only five senses. I rolled a six. So what's going to happen now, right? Mm-hmm. You were thinking that. Uh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, I have listened to before. But so sense is the wild card. Mm-hmm. So here we go. Here's the wild card. Uh, dinner with one person dead or alive. Who would it be? Dinner with one person dead or alive. Yep. Um, see, that would be, that would be a really, really tough question. Um, uh, I think if I could have dinner with any one person, uh, I think it would be probably Douglas Adams. Uh, he's a writer. Um, he wrote The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, um, a Dirk Gently Solistic Detective Agency, what we named our cat after. Um, and he had just an incredible life. Um, he made our job hopping look casual in comparison. You know, he was everything from a bodyguard to, you know, some Arab who had a ton of oil money to writing for the show Doctor Who to working on a farm, picking up chicken eggs to traveling down to South America to, you know, study wildlife. Like he did so many different things. And I, I imagine a dinner with him, he would have so much to share, you know? And, and I love hearing about different 
parts of the world from other people's point of view. I really, I really think that's, that would be an incredible, incredible evening. <laughs> would you even say it would be incredible to walk in his shoes? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Little show plug there. Yeah. Yeah. Kennedy, uh, thanks for coming on. I'm going to give you the last words. Um, you love your parents though, right? Yeah. You do. I do. Yeah. I'm not saying that you're saying that. Yeah, absolutely. I do. Regardless of what I believe or what they believe, I do. Do you think that's important for people to know? I do. Yeah. Okay. All right. Like you don't have any animosity towards them. You don't, I, as I far do. as this church thing goes. Um, I, I would say I don't have active animosity. You know, resentment is, is still there. And I think that's just part of life. You know, like it's, I still love them. That doesn't change how I feel about them, you know. Um, there's there's things they've done that were very hurtful to me, but I still love them. I still care about them, you know. So I, I, I think it doesn't matter. Well, my hope is is that maybe after they hear this, they would then spark a conversation to take place. Spark a moment to say, you know what? Now that time has passed and emotions have been kind of what they are, mm -hmm. maybe it's time to relook at this and re see, you know, where we may have made mistakes, where you have made mistakes, maybe where they have made mistakes, whatever. But maybe that's, maybe that could happen. Who knows? I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. Time will tell. Time will tell. Kennedy, thanks for coming on. Uh, I love the fact that you, you stayed awake for me <laughs> and stayed awake so we could do this. I think that's awesome. Uh, I really hope uh, that, at least my hope is, is that, you know, I know you know this one, Fifel, American Tale. What does he say? No idea. You don't remember Fifel, the American Tale? It. Unless I saw it when I was like a I little I think you kid. saw it when you were a little kid. Maybe. But yeah. Feifel says, if you haven't seen American Tale, go watch American Tale. It's a really old movie. But Feifel says, never say never. Okay. So are you, are, you, are you willing to make that, maybe that statement to say, I'm never going to say never to church again? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm just cut off. I'm never going to yeah. go back. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I am open, you know. I... If, if something happens that makes me change, fantastic. That's great. But I'm not holding my breath either. So, but yeah, I'm, I'm not, I am not uh, opposed to the idea of church, you know? So yeah, okay. I would say absolutely. All right. All right. With that being said, we uh, close out this episode of Other People's Shoes. Again, I would just like to thank my guest, Kennedy, for being on and staying awake, uh, as we already alluded to, and just the fact that he was willing to come on and be vulnerable and share some stuff. And uh, I would just say, remember, when you walk in other people's shoes, you really do get a different perspective on life. 